from Toronto, the CBC Evening News with Suhana Marchand. Good evening. Tonight, a plan to take on U.S. polluters in the courts. We in Toronto live downwind of the biggest smog belt on the continent. The Nobel Committee makes a house call on Doctors Without Borders. It's a recognition of the need for this kind of work in the world today. And saving for a child's education requires an education in saving. Just start putting money aside a little bit every month. Take a long, deep breath downtown, and chances are a lot of the stuff you'll draw into your lungs has U.S. citizenship. At least that's what many city officials believe, that Toronto's smog comes from somewhere south of the border. Toronto may soon become part of a huge lawsuit against some big American polluters. Christine Crowther reports. The Ohio Valley is home to some of the heaviest polluters in the United States. 17 coal-fired power plants in several states are about to be sued by the state of New York. The reason? The pollution they're throwing into the air is being carried across state lines. It's the same reason these people are meeting in Toronto today. We in Toronto live downwind of the biggest smog belt in the, on the continent, right? And it's crippling our people. And it, frankly, as a fiscal conservative, I can't afford to pay the health bills anymore. The city of Toronto estimates that problems from air pollution send about 300 people to hospital every year and kill another 400. The city has invited lawyers from the New York Attorney General's office to meet with them in Toronto. They want to find out how they can help with the lawsuit. It's a welcome offer. I uh, would certainly uh, grab a lot of attention and it would require the court to consider issues that perhaps it hadn't considered before, such as the effects of this pollution going beyond the boundaries of the United States. This past summer was one of the worst for smog in Toronto. Toronto's public health office says about half the problem comes from coal-fired plants in the American Midwest. It says the other half is coming from here in Ontario. Local environmentalists who were at today's meeting believe there's a lot of work to be done at home. The City of Toronto is trying to figure out ways to convince the Ontario plants to clean up. In the meantime, it still has to figure out if it wants to join the American lawsuit. One of the things it doesn't know yet is how much the whole process is going to cost. Christine Crowther, CBC News, Toronto. If body rub parlors are just any other business, then a new Vaughn bylaw won't disturb them much. But if body rub parlors address a profound need, then forcing them to keep regular business hours and closing them on the weekends might cause quite a disturbance. Our municipal affairs reporter Adam Vaughn has the story. Kind of cards they, they put on car windows and doors and we found out that in shopping plazas in, in church parking lots this Vaughn counselor sponsored the bylaw that will now restrict body rub parlors to weekday daytime only hours but Devana didn't stop there what we've done basically is we limited the locations where they can be away from people away from commercial plazas away from retail operations away from normal uh, traffic Second, what we've done is we limited the numbers of them. There could only be one per plaza itself or one in, per industrial unit. This industrial park near Jane and Highway 7 is now one of the zones, and if the remote location and a restriction on business doesn't work, the city of Vaughan will tie the clubs up in red tape. You're subject to a very high registration cost, and everybody that works for you is going to have to be licensed with the city of Vaughan. So this is one business the city of Vaughan doesn't want? That's correct. We, have, we want our community standards to be the highest possible, and we're basically saying get out of town. The local police here, applaud Vaughn's new bylaws and hope the example rubs off on other municipalities. Uh, I think that uh, there needs to be a statement made. If people are, uh, are concerned about a certain activity, then I think that they have to take initiative. And uh, I think it's going to carry into other municipalities. I believe that anyway. The new bylaws have caught the attention of some of Toronto's city councillors. I'm, I'm very happy to look at their plan and what they have in mind uh, because I feel very strongly that there should be a zone of tolerance, a red light district somewhere in the city of Toronto. I still feel strongly about that. In the past, the waterfront has been proposed as a red light district for Toronto, but another councillor says controlling the sex trade with land use policy only creates other problems. Putting it in an industrial area makes it unsafe for the people who work in the trade, and that's a big mistake. 
a couple other reasons why this bylaw probably wouldn't get used in Toronto. One is that most of the licensing changes are based on changes that Toronto made to its own licensing bylaws about four years ago. And the other thing is the land use policy stuff. Toronto's land use policy is much more complicated than the 905 land use policy, and it'd be very difficult for the city to move in on this. And the bottom line here is that it will do nothing to alter the street trade, and that's the real problem facing people in the downtown. Now, Adam, are these restrictions on the body rub business likely to stand up to any further legal scrutiny? Well, Julian Fantino said that if zoning changes was all it took to get rid of prostitution, prostitution wouldn't be the world's oldest profession. They're expected to be challenged in court, probably civil court, and the operators are going to be looking for equal rights to their neighbours as they get put into these new industrial parks. So it doesn't look like this one's going to last very long. Thank you, Adam. It's looking positive for a deal between the CAW and the last of the big three automakers. The General Motors offer matches the other company's increases in wages and benefits. Buzz Hargrove says the offer is positive but still falls short. What has the union troubled is GM's lack of commitment to future work at its plant in St. Therese. The Quebec government has promised GM subsidies to keep the plant working and Premier Harris doesn't approve. We're opposed to any province doing it. We don't do it. It probably, though, points out to GM that, uh, that Quebec uh, is $360 million less competitive than Ontario. It's frustrating as hell to wake up this morning after uh, a very late night of work and find Mike Harris out criticizing uh, a government that's trying to attract good jobs for the province of, of Quebec. He ought to keep his goddamn nose out of the business of the people of Quebec because we got several thousand workers and their families and those communities that rely on this operation. He ought to leave it to us at the bargaining table and to the responsible government of Quebec. In previous deals, the auto workers have secured wage hikes of about 4.5% a year, including cost of living increases. The GM strike deadline, by the way, is Tuesday midnight. Tonight, we'll go close up. From the man who gave the world dynamite, a tribute to the people who pick up from its effects. Uh, well, I think what um, brings doctors and nurses and other uh, individuals to work with MSF is the fact that we work very much hand-to-hand. -hand. I mean, we're one individual volunteer working with an individual refugee or, or, or whatever the case may be. It's very tangible. It's very tangible. Yeah. It's very real. Doctors Without Borders wins the Nobel Peace Prize. A feature interview later in Close Up. Who's the last man you'd think of when you think of Toronto? For just about everyone, resident or not, it's Mel. The mayor is more than aware of his profile in this city and uses it to peddle Toronto as a place to work, as a place to live, as a beer. It's getting harder to know which has more currency, Toronto or Mel. As Paul Riley reports, with the striking of a new coin, the mayor seems to have the currency race won as well. Handshakes, smiles, and bombastic monologues. Well, and that's all within happen. a brief encounter. So the federal government, if they want to take us to court, they want to throw me in jail, do what the hell you want, but there's no more money. Whether shooting off on Friday or bringing out a tank when a shovel won't do, he is Toronto's own. Or maybe that's the beer he endorsed. Uh, uh, Toronto's little big man leads a hectic pace. It's hard to understand how he balances it. Just don't fall in. But much like the little engine that could, he thinks he can. A young lady said to me on the elevator this morning, thank goodness it's Friday. <laughs> it doesn't mean nothing to me anymore. Like I'm going all day tomorrow and all day Sunday. This morning alone, a food bank drive is sandwiched between a meeting with the mayor of Montreal and this. It's the Millennium Coin, or Mel-Linium. The mayor is asking you to put your money where his face is. But whose face is it? Oh, oh black guy. Um, it celebrates an African. Hmm? That's Mel Laffman. Oh, it doesn't look like Mel Laffman at all. That looks like an African? Yeah. I would say it looked like um, Kwame Nkrumah. I'm serious. He looks like a black man on here. <laughs> Doesn't he, don't you think? 150,000 of these things were made. At $5 a piece, the money goes to charity. Once they're sold out, that's it. There will never be a, there will not, never be a second run. That being said, I'd better hold on to mine. Do I get to keep No, 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 you go on your way. <laughs> it's the greatest job in the world. Uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Paul Riley, CBC News, Toronto. 
The Internet allows people to do all kinds of things they've never been able to do before, and some of them may not be especially legal. May not be, because this stuff is so new, the laws may not have caught up. But copyright lawyers think they know a breach when they see it, and many see it and hear it on Internet radio stations. Steve Irwin reports. Welcome. You are listening to Durham City Central Radio, The Wave at ocentral.com. Oshawa's newest radio station takes the airwaves. Well, not exactly the airwaves. This broadcast is going out on web waves, the newest addition to a rapidly growing number of internet radio stations. Bringing the world to Durham, the new way to listen. Hundreds of established radio stations are already broadcasting on the web, but more and more independents are setting up shops and basements and back rooms. And because the CRTC doesn't regulate the internet, Nobody needs a license. Is everything okay with you? Yeah. yeah In this case, Joe and Gino, the publisher of Oshawa's weekly paper, decided he wanted to expand. He says one of the best things about being a web broadcaster is that you don't have to pay any royalties. That's because the music isn't really music, but bits of computer data. Don't worry, he says. He's doing the artist a favor. We're opening more doors for these artists, so there's no reason for them to be uh, uh, upset or you know feel that there's any infringement, because there aren't. Okay, if anything, we're helping them out at no cost to them. You could take this nice shiny CD of uh, Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn, and you could say, well, there's no music there. There's just um, 650 megabytes of data. That's not music. That's just a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh-huh. David Baskin is a lawyer who collects royalties for songwriters. He says, let webcasters play all they want. Just don't forget to pay the piper. We don't have any problem in principle with people using our music on the web, with, with people reproducing it. We just want to get paid. I would be delighted to talk to this fellow, and I certainly would encourage him to see a lawyer. The Copyright Board of Canada is conducting hearings to determine if web radio broadcasters should be forced to pay royalties. A decision is expected early in the new year. Until then, web broadcasters will be riding the waves for free. Steve Irwin, CBC News, Toronto. The man who's the Canadian king of Marvin Gardens started out as the kid from Portage in Maine. Winnipeg's Bill Bartell is this year's Canadian Monopoly champion. Bartell aggressively moved his little horse around the board to take his second national title. If he passes go and takes the world championship, he wins 15,140 US dollars, the amount of play money in a Monopoly set. The province is going to make it a little easier for all the people waiting to get their driver's license to actually take the driver's test. More than 200,000 hopeful drivers are now waiting for someone to give them a road test, and some have waited for more than a year. The province will spend $25 million to hire more examiners. It's hoped the waiting time can be reduced to six weeks, but that's not likely to happen until July 2001. Canada will be seeking to expel Pakistan from the Commonwealth when the leaders meet in London next week. It doesn't seem much of a threat to the country's new military ruler, who's just appointed himself supreme leader and declared a state of emergency. It's a controversial move, but only outside of Pakistan, as the CBC's Patrick Brown reports. The routine of daily life in Pakistan carries on pretty much uninterrupted by the state of emergency. There was a large congregation, as usual, for Friday prayers at Islamabad's Faisal Mosque. The Parliament buildings, by contrast, were deserted. Parliament's been dissolved, and no one but the army showed up for a session that had originally been scheduled for today. In the newspapers, people read about other countries' condemnation of the state of emergency, but most Pakistanis don't seem to share the world's outrage. We like the action of army very much. We don't see any harassment or anything. People are pretty okay with the whole situation. Army takeover and the suspension of democracy has been widely accepted by Pakistanis. Attitudes might change if the flow of investment, aid and loans dries up and the country is pushed into economic crisis because the rest of the world disapproves of military rule. Many democratically minded Pakistanis, like lawyer and political analyst Abdul Hafiz Pirzada, hope the military authorities will be given a breathing space. Let the West or the democracies not be in too much of a hurry to judge. After all, they must take account of one factor, that the people of Pakistan have accepted this change. 
the weekly Friday market was bustling today. But only last year, Pakistan was rescued from the brink of economic collapse by the International Monetary Fund. The IMF has already cut off all aid. And Pakistan could be back on that brink within weeks if the world tightens the screws. Patrick Brown, CBC News, Islamabad. In Israel today, prison cells were emptied of about 150 inmates, Palestinians convicted of murdering Israelis in a series of bomb attacks. Their release is part of an interim peace agreement signed six weeks ago. Needless to say, some Israelis are extremely unhappy about this amnesty. But in the West Bank and Gaza, it's a day of celebration. Neil MacDonald reports. Many of these men killed fellow Palestinians suspected of collaborating with Israel. Others belonged to violent organizations bent on destroying the Jewish state. The previous Israeli government was determined to keep them in jail, but Israel's new administration has been keeping its promises and did so again today. Originally, Israel resisted releasing members of extremist groups, but then relented and changed its criteria. The men were freed from Israeli prisons this morning and turned over to the Palestinian Authority, which considers them heroes and freedom fighters. Any, any release of prisoners and any re release of land and liberation of land from the Israeli occupation, it will be see seen as a positive thing. We welcome uh, the release of these uh, prisoners. We look forward to see all the prisoners outside the jails. But right-wing Israeli politicians oppose the release of Palestinians with blood on their hands even though Jews who have killed for nationalist reasons are often pardoned outright. Changing the criteria brings the terrorists to the idea that they can get away with everything once they are talking about Israel. And these Jews from Israel's extreme right wing who protest any development that benefits Palestinians were out again today. They urged the Israeli government to execute all the prisoners instead of releasing them. Neil MacDonald, CBC News, Jerusalem. Hurricane Irene has started her destructive work in Florida and begun with the Keys. Schools closed today and Key West declared a state of emergency as 120 kilometer an hour winds and pounding rains threatened to flood large parts of the state. But this hurricane has just started. The real storm is expected tonight or early tomorrow. Still ahead on the CBC Evening News, recognition for a job well done. Doctors Without Borders wins the Nobel Peace Prize. That's later in Close Up. But first, outside to Front Street and Bill Lawrence with this early look at the weather. Bill? Well, indeed. Well, Sue Hannah, before we get to that, this is probably going to be a weekend for the last chance to see the progression of color, that beautiful panorama that's across much of Ontario. Well, much of the province now does not present that color up in the North Country, around Muskoka and Algonquin Park and Ottawa and Barry Huronia. They're all past their peak in the Niagara Peninsula, particularly along the Niagara Parkway. About a 90% color change there. In Burlington at the Royal Botanical Gardens, about 80%. Southwestern Ontario down by Grand Bend, about 75%. All of those areas will probably peak this weekend, and the Kawarthas and Own Sound are also at their peak at the present time. So this is probably going to be the last weekend to see that beautiful color. As for the weather, well, beautiful is the word we'll use there again. Nice, clear night tonight. The overnight low, balmy, about 10 degrees. Usually we're at 4. Then for tomorrow, a sunny Saturday. The temperature high, expected 20. Don't be surprised if you get 1 or 2 degrees above that. Summer's still hanging on. We'll look at the rest of the country, and of course we'll do that a little later on. This weather report has been brought to you by Winterco. Canadian outerwear for Canadian climates. Now online shopping at winterco.ca. What's up, Doc? The Nobel Peace Prize. That's what for Doctors Without Borders. It's an organization that sends volunteers to war zones to treat the wounded, the sick, and the hungry. Internationally, it's known as Médecins Sans Frontières. It was founded in 1971 by a group of doctors in Paris who wanted to do more than the Red Cross was able to. It's a volunteer organization that treats victims of war, famine, and other disasters. There are now more than 2,000 medical professionals working in 80 countries around the world, including in East Timor, Kosovo, and Sudan. 
In recent years, winners of the Nobel Peace Prize have emerged from world events. Last year, the Northern Ireland peace process was at a key junction when the prize was awarded jointly to Protestant David Trimble and Catholic John Hume. In 1997, the prize was given to the international campaign to ban landmines. The president of Doctors Without Borders in Canada is Dr. Michael Schul. He's with the Sunnybrook and Women's Health Sciences Center here in Toronto. And I have to say, congratulations. You must still be floating on cloud nine. How did Absolutely. you find out about this? Well, from you guys, actually. <laughs> CBC phoned me at uh, 10 past 5 this morning. and woke Because me up we with are the good on news. top of stories. Absolutely, yes, indeed. And uh, sure enough, uh, that's, that's how I heard. What was your reaction? Surprise, uh, groggy surprise initially, uh, elation. Uh, I mean, I'm very proud, I'm very honored uh, on behalf of all of the, the uh, volunteers who work with MSF, on behalf of the local people that we, that we work with in our missions, and then on behalf of the people that we actually try to help. I think it's an honor for us all. An honor, but a lot of you, and you mentioned the volunteers and the personnel, work in obscurity uh, in a lot of ways. What does this award mean then? Well, I think, it, I, mean, I think it has meanings on many levels. I think on, on the one hand, it's a recognition of the value uh, and the quality of the work that we do as an organization. Um, I think on another, on another level, it's a recognition of the need for this kind of work in the world today. Um, and I personally think that it also draws attention to the fact that um, you know, the world has changed dramatically in the last 10 years or so. And governments, which traditionally were involved more in, in these conflicts uh, in faraway and places, foreign aid, and foreign yeah. aid, uh, and also in influencing the policies of local governments, are not doing that anymore, uh, because many of these conflicts have no geopolitical interest anymore, and so they're just left by the wayside. Uh, and you know, the, the volunteer non-governmental organizations have had to fill that void, um, and we've been able to do that in part, but, I, but, I, but we certainly can't do it all. We're not political actors, we're not military actors. We can't, we, while we may facilitate to some degree uh, ultimate solutions, we certainly can't bring those about. And, and so I think that we need to, to put pressure again back on governments and, and UN bodies to remain and increase their involvement in these, in these problems. Have you heard from anyone from the Hill? Uh, I, I haven't personally. Um, I presume our office people probably have. Uh, I've been in the studio too much today, I think, to, <laughs> to actually get, take a call. But, um, but I'm sure that our, you know, we have people who deal directly with CEDA and with other government uh, uh, people, and I'm sure that that, that word will get around pretty quickly. When you talk about the influence uh, that this award may have in bringing not only recognition but money, what are you looking for from, from the Canadian government? Well. Uh, well, for one thing, you know, there's no, no secret that the foreign aid budgets have been cut dramatically in Canada and in, in other Western countries. And I think we are in an era where, where we're doing better financially as a country. I think that, that it would be appropriate that, uh, that those budgets are restored somewhat. Um, the need is certainly there. It's growing, if anything. Um, I think the other thing that we'd like to see, not only from the Canadian government, but also from, from the Canadian public, is that um, when we are trying to be a vehicle for the stories of the people that we're helping, the, the, the stories of the suffering, whether it's from man-made oppression, whether it's from natural disaster, mm -hmm. the stories that we're trying to bring home to Canadians, to the Canadian government. Um, I hope that this prize will help to, to um, make people listen to us a little bit more than they might have before. Can you share a story that you, uh, stay cl you know, keeps close to your heart? Um, about the work that, that I did? Well, you know, I think that what, is, what has always impressed me and uh, what I think what um, brings doctors and nurses and other uh, individuals to work with MSF is the fact that we work very much hand-to-hand. -hand. And we're one individual volunteer working with an individual refugee or, or, or whatever the case it's may be. It's very tangible. It's very tangible. Yeah. It's very real. And, um, and the, the flip side of that is, of course, the, the trust and the belief that the, the person you're working with has in you. And, and I can recall a, a situation in, in, in Bangladesh from several years ago where a, um, a, a father brought his young son, who was about five or six years old, to our, our small hospital in, in the middle of this refugee camp in the middle of nowhere, um, who had a very serious heart infection, one that even in Canada would be, would be very serious, um, bacterial pericarditis. And um, you know, we did everything we could in terms of the treatments that were available to us there, but unfortunately the child died. And it's always a tragedy, I mean, not necessarily that rare, unfortunately, in those circumstances, but it's still tragic. And what impressed me, though, was that a couple of days later, the father brought his other son to us, who was also sick. 
um, luckily much less seriously and we were able to treat. But what that demonstrated to me was that this man really believed in us, believed that we would do our very best, that we would do whatever we could to help him. And I think even if he'd had options, you know, to go elsewhere to another uh, dispensary somewhere else, he would have come back uh, to, to us. W what we do frequently, uh, sometimes all we're able to do is to actually be at the side of somebody who's suffering who is, tremendously. Yes. And we may, in, in some very extreme cases, that may be virtually all that we do, and yet that's an extremely important act. And it's an extremely important human and, and humane act, I think. Dr. Michael Scholl, congratulations again, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We'd like to hear your reaction to Doctors Without Borders being awarded this year's Nobel Peace Prize. So give us a call. Our phone number is 205-7700. Our fax number is 205-7166. And here is our email address, tvnews at toronto.cbc.ca. Last night, we asked for your suggestions on how 18-wheelers and four-wheelers could better share the province's roads. Here are a few of your comments. Trucks and cars can easily share the highway. All they have to do is slow down a bit and keep two to three chevrons apart. In other words, use their heads, don't sit on them. I really think if we went back to the photo um, speed limit control with the cameras, it was a lot safer and uh, seemed to really work when it was happening. I wish the government would go back to that again. I think the trucks should have their own lane and the cars their own lane. It's the only way that it'll ever work. The cars and trucks just don't mix. Maybe you should try, try to uh, do what they do in Europe and keep all the trucks in the one lane. We appreciate all of your comments. Lots more to come tonight, including Brendan Connor with sports. And Brendan, I've got a date with Cujo tonight, although he doesn't know it. <laughs> I thought you had a date with your two kids to watch <laughs> the Leafs three, game. Three, three, they kids. keep growing. But uh, the Leafs back on the road. Uh, yes, they're on uh, Chicago tonight and St. Louis tomorrow. So an interesting road trip because Chicago, when you play the Hawks, they handled the Hawks okay in preseason, but that was with Sundin around. Could it be a different story tonight? We'll have details when we come back on the CBC Evening News. Closed captioning of this program is brought to you by Lotto 649 and its multi-million dollar jackpots. Lotto 649, imagine the freedom. This sports report is brought to you by your neighborhood Chrysler retailer. Chrysler, engineered to be great cars. Welcome back. As mentioned, the Maple Leafs are on the road in Chicago tonight and then St. Louis tomorrow. Now, Coach Pat Quinn has decided he will dress tough guys Chris King and Chris McAllister tonight for the game in Chicago just in case the going gets rough. And that has been the case with the Blackhawks so far this young season. Now, Toronto beat Chicago in preseason play with a late goal and then came up with an important win this week against Florida. And they were particularly encouraged by the come-from-behind win and also some of the poised play by the recently returned number 18, Alan McCauley. I felt like I uh, was adjusting to the pace a lot, uh, a lot more, or, or uh, a lot more often. I was in the play and, and not so much chasing or behind it, and uh, um, just thought that uh, my timing was a lot better for the second game, and, and uh, uh, had some good faceoffs, and and uh, just kind of taking it uh, game by game, and, and trying to piece my my game together that same way. Well, especially with the absence of Matt Sundin, it'll be important for McCauley to step up his game. Leafs against Chicago from the United Center tonight. Hawks, of course, with old friends Wendell Clark and Doug Gilmore on that team now. Meanwhile, the Toronto Raptors are in action tonight as well as they play their second exhibition game. This time they're hosting the L.A. Clippers at the ACC. The Raptors looked a bit ragged on Tuesday as they dropped a game to Milwaukee. Among those looking most out of sorts was John Thomas and also center Michael Stewart. But the coach says they'll get more court time tonight. At some point in these next four games, I'd like to get more minutes for him. You know, I would. Uh, he needs them. He played very well with the first unit in the scrimmages. And uh, that's why I said I may play less people so those guys get a better feel for each other. Because right now, Oakley and Antonio and Yogi and John Thomas don't have a great feel for the four of them. 
With all the Raptors be hitting the floor at the ACC without Kevin Willis, the veteran center is battling a stomach ulcer, so expect to see lots of Michael Stewart and John Thomas and Antonio Davis in the lineup tonight in the middle. In baseball news, the Cleveland Indians have fired manager Mike Hargrove. Now, he managed the Tribe to a couple of World Series appearances, but failed to win them a title. He's been there eight years, and this firing comes just a few days after the Indians blew a two-game lead and lost to Boston in the divisional playoff. Now, tonight, the NLCS continues with Atlanta in at Shea to play the Mets. And frankly, things don't look good for the Mets. The Braves have won 20 of the last 26 times they've played New York. They've also held the Mets to three runs or fewer 11 times this year. Glavin against Leiter. A couple of football notes quickly. The Toronto Argos go down the road to play their rivals on the QEW, the Hamilton Tiger Cats. That's at Ivor Wynn Stadium. That is tomorrow. And as uh, speaking of down the road, as for the NFL, Doug Flutie will try to continue his magic events against a very good defense as the Buffalo Bills on Sunday entertain the Raiders from the West Coast. That's going to do it for the early check on sports. We'll see you tonight on the CBC Late Night News. Over to Mike Wise with tonight's entertainment and checking out the fall colors, the lazy way, inside an artist's home. Unless you're a bad driver. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the other way, of course. You know, we're talking about art tours this weekend. You can find them almost any time of the year, somewhere, wherever some neighborhood artists are getting together and organizing a tour of their studios and homes and showing off their work. There are tours happening this weekend in the beaches, in the annex, and in the area around the Ronsonville Avenue. I think we could use a few more. This is the part of the show the artists don't really want you to see. All the behind the scenes work that goes into setting up their homes and their studios so they can showcase their work. For them, the effort is worth it. It's a change from putting their work in a gallery or selling it to a wholesaler. All of us pretty much work in isolation, so it's the first chance we get for people to come in and give us feedback on our work. It's also a chance to sell some work. On this particular West End Artists Tour, a total of six homes will be open to the public to peruse. But strangely, you won't see any signs outside 51 Grenadier advertising the show. The participants are worried about keeping the scale of the show manageable. They've sent out thousands of invitations and maps to past customers and other interested parties. I, I think it's pretty good. All the locations are very close together, so it's very accessible in a practical way, as in you can get from each location within sort of five minutes or less. You know, you can walk, you can bike, you can drive. Organizers admit the success of a neighborhood art show can be hit or miss. In past years, they've tried organizing by committee, but this year it was left up to two artists to do the work, with all the others picking up the costs for the posters and publicity. It's very challenging to keep it going and to keep it strong and keep the momentum up. Not only tonight, some news from uh, the world of broadcasting. Uh, the Western International Communications, one of the country's uh, broadcasters, uh, had two big suitors trying to split up its uh, assets, CanWest Global and Shaw Communications. They've been trying to hammer out a detail between the two companies since about 1988. Today, they finally announced they'd worked out the details. The deal should be signed by about uh, November 1st, worth about $1.45 billion in that global, CanWest Global will pay about $950 million and pick up nine TV stations. Shaw Communications and a new spun-off media company it has called Chorus Entertainment will pick up all of uh, Wick's radio stations. Um, this means Global actually will pick up stations uh, in Hamilton, on TV in Hamilton, as well as several stations in Alberta, making it uh, the country's third cross-country broadcaster, coast to coast. So Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Still ahead on the CBC Evening News, planning to put away a few dollars for the kids' education? What if they turn on you? If Billy wants to take this $50,000 out and go and buy a Porsche when he's 18, yes. Before you start setting cash away for the kids' education, you might want to hit the books yourself on how to invest. That story, next. As governments bail out on paying for higher education, more pressure is on parents to put aside a few dollars for university tuition. One estimate suggests new parents had better have $100,000 to give their children an education. For most, that means saving as soon as the children are born. 
There are many ways to save, and parents need to do some homework on what's right for the family. Chris Armstrong focuses on a few plans. At five years old, Ulika Mayer is just starting her school experience. Her biggest concern these days? Playtime. I go to school. The University of Winnipeg is situated right across from Ulika's daycare. If Ulika has any hopes about going to that school, she had better start to save money. By the time she graduates from university, it's expected her four-year degree will have cost her close to $75,000. Ulika's mother, Chandra, knows all about the high cost of going to school. I'm already over $30,000 in debt. She's a third-year university student. By the time she graduates, she'll be closer to $60,000 in student loan debt. She's determined not to let the same thing happen to her daughter. I'm walking out of my education with this incredible, incredible debt load that really interferes with the ability to, you know, buy a house or, or sort of move on with the rest of my life in any sort of financial sense. And uh, I absolutely don't want her to, to be in that same kind of situation. Ann Colstead is a certified financial planner who says parents had better start to save if they want to send their child to university or college. If you want to help your child out, no matter what, it is, just start something. Just start putting money aside a little bit every month. The cost of university tuition in Manitoba over the past 10 years has jumped 170%. That $75,000 figure we quoted before, it's a conservative estimate. If your child is going to go away to school, you're looking at paying close to $100,000 for a four-year degree. The best bet is to find a savings plan that will shelter your money from taxes. Now, there are a couple of different plans that can do this for you, but there is no magic bullet. Both of the plans have benefits and pitfalls. Yay! Good. Meet the Peterson Slonowski family. Cheryl Slonowski and her husband, Brian Peterson, are using one of these plans to save for three-year-old Eric's education. Okay, let's do another one. And in these days of low interest rates, they found a plan yes. with a guaranteed 20% return on their money. Good for you. The cost of education is going to rise, and 20% um, return is pretty damn good. The couple is doing this through a Registered Education Savings Plan, or RESP, and the Canada Education Savings Grant. Here's how it works. Say Brian and Sandy invest $1,000 a year for Eric's education. The federal government will in turn kick in 20% of that, or $200 in an education savings grant, for a total return of $1,200. Then, of course, they still get the regular interest on their investment, if it generates any. The plan allows for up to $7,200 in government grant money per child. Where else can you get a 20% a, a guaranteed return on your investment? Now, there aren't too many families who would walk away from a guaranteed 20% return, but this family has. Well, they get a game over. Bill and Cheryl Porter are also saving for their kids' education, but they happily refuse to take any of the education savings grant from government. The Porters have instead opted for another plan, an informal in-trust account for the children's education. Why? They found too many restrictions with an RESP. That RSP, maybe, the way I look at it, is sort of sunk into a black hole. Here's what Bill is talking about. If for some reason his kids don't go on to university or college, instead turning their love of video games into a software business when they turn 18, Bill and Cheryl can turn over the money from the trust to the kids. No questions asked. Okay. That's not the case with Brian and Sandy. There are heavy financial penalties if Eric doesn't go to university or college. Say they've saved $40,000 for Eric. If he foregoes school, Brian and Sandy have to give back that $7,200, the 20% grant the government has given them. And they have to pay taxes on the interest their investment has made at their normal tax rate, plus a 20% penalty. That could push their tax rate to 70%. I look at it as sort of, in a way, it's, it's, it's like any other investment. There's going to be a risk involved. Um, 
I know that, uh, that uh, there are some other options that are available if, if, if uh, he chooses not to go to university. Here are the options for Brian and Sandy to avoid the taxes if Eric doesn't go to school. They can change the beneficiary on the plan to another blood relative, or they can roll the fund, less the grant money, into their RRSPs. But they have to have contribution room left. Otherwise, they pay the taxes. No, you have to. But don't think the porters haven't taken some risks either. Besides giving up the grant, in trust accounts technically mean once the child turns 18, the trust fund is theirs to do with as they please. In fact, children and parents have ended up in court over in trust accounts. Ann Colstead warns extra care must be taken when setting up an in-trust account. And if Billy wants to take this $50,000 out and go and buy a Porsche when he's 18, yes. In fact, there have been cases. There have been. When the child has actually sued the parents over this Absolutely. money. Absolutely. Financial planners say every family is different, and both plans have merit. As for Eulika's education, the most important thing may not be which savings plan her mother chooses, but that mom starts a savings plan. That report by Chris Armstrong of CBC Winnipeg. We'll be back with the day's business news and the weather forecast right after this break. This business report is brought to you by the Business Development Bank of Canada. In business for small business. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Ozawa. Inflation numbers on both sides of the border created more fears of interest rate hikes today. Here in this country, Stats Canada says the annual rate of inflation rose to 2.6% in September, up from 2.1% in August. That was a surprise to most analysts. The core rate of inflation, which excludes the volatile prices of food and energy, was up 1.8% of September from a year ago. That may not be enough for the Bank of Canada to pull the trigger on higher interest rates because it's still below the midpoint of the bank's target range for inflation. But bank officials warn they're watching for any shrinkage in our unused production capacity as an indication higher rates are needed. The U.S. Labor Department reported today that prices at the wholesale level increased 1.1 percent in September. That's the largest increase in nine years. The news follows a warning by the head of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Alan Greenspan said financial institutions should set aside more money in case there's a market downturn. Let's have a look at how all this affected the markets. The TSE lost 85 points to end the day at 6,884. The Dow plunged trading below the 10,000 mark and then rallied a bit, closing off 266 points at 10,019. The Lindy lost more than a quarter of a U.S. cent, closing at 67.26, but it was worse against the euro, down almost nine-tenths of a euro cent to trade at 61.79. And I'll have more business news later tonight on the CBC Late Night News. See you then. Back outside to Bill Lawrence with the weather here and across the country. Bill? Well, here we are going to be in for another summer-like weekend, even though it's fall. That's for southern Ontario. As for the rest of the country, well, let's have a look. Across Yukon, across the territories, across much of Nunavut today, mainly cloudy skies and temperatures not far from the 2-degree mark. Out on the west coast, it continued sunny and warm. Vancouver and Victoria near 14 degrees. It was sunny in the interior. Cranbrook at about 9 degrees. Prince George today at 6. And if you're visiting from Edmonton, well, aren't you glad? Glad you're here. There in Red Deer, cloudy, six was the high. Strong northwesterly winds gusting about 50 kilometers an hour. Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, a similar story in the temperature there, about seven. Saskatoon and Regina, well, Saskatoon had the cloud. Regina had the sun. They both had a temperature of about eight degrees. La Range was overcast and four. Thompson, Manitoba, cloudy and three. In the south, Winnipeg, Brandon overcast and not far from 11 degree mark. Along the river today, Lachine and Montreal were cloudy and 10 degrees, but Chibukamu, or rather Chicoutimi and Sherbrooke and Quebec cities were sunny and about eight. Up in uh, Labrador, well, it continued to snow. They'll probably have about 15 or 20 centimeters before it's over. Temperature mid-afternoon at one degree. Also some light snow up around Shefferville and Labrador City in northern Quebec. The temperature there at minus one. Into Atlantic Canada, the winds that we had the other day are now pounding the three provinces. 
up to 100 kilometers an hour in most areas. It was sunny at Fredericton at 9 degrees, partly cloudy at Charlottetown and Summerside, and Halifax was sunny, and 10 in Sydney was overcast at 6 degrees. St. John's and Stephenville both telling us they had some rain this afternoon and temperatures near the 7 degree mark. Here in southern Ontario, in northern areas, mainly cloudy throughout the day. That included Peterborough and uh, Kingston, and on towards the Ottawa Valley at about 13 degrees. Northern Ontario all the way up to about Timmins and Kapuskasing around 10. Sault Ste. Marie was also overcast in 14. Thunder Bay, Dryden, Fort Francis, Sulacout, a uh, whole area north of Superior, cloudy and not far from the 8 degree mark. In contrast, a sunny day in most of southern Ontario, and temperatures getting up just about the norm, which is 15 degrees. Well, overnight, we'll stay above the normal floor. Clear skies expected. This bit of cloud will dissipate, we expect, in a few hours. The overnight low at 10 degrees. Tomorrow, sunny and 20. And on Sunday, increasing cloudiness. Showers developing, a 70% chance of showers. Windy on Monday, and temperatures down to the 10-degree mark. Tuesday is partly cloudy, not far from 10. So we get a fine, sunny, and warm Saturday, and then we slide back to where we should be, fall time. Suhana? Thank you, Bill. And that is the CBC Evening News. Join Ron Azawa and our late night news team for an update on all of your local stories that's following the national. I'm Suhana. For all of us here, thank you for watching. Have a wonderful weekend. We leave you with some great fall colors. Good night.